Hi, my name is Charles Kuntz, and I'm one of the surgeons at Southpaws. Today, our first case is a left adrenalectomy. It's a dog that has an adrenal gland tumor about two and a half centimeters in diameter. Um, dog presented uh, just for a wellness check at the primary care vet, and they did blood work and found that the ALT was elevated. And so they did an abdominal ultrasound and found a left adrenal gland tumor. Um, on further discussion with the owners, um, they did indicate that he was polyuric and polydipsic and a bit polyphagic as well. Um, and we have not done uh, adrenal function testing, but the contralateral adrenal gland is small, so it's only about a half a centimeter in diameter. So given those combinations of clinical signs, we did discuss the possibility of doing adrenal gland function testing, and they elected to just go in and do surgery and remove this thing. Um, it's on the left-hand side, and left-hand adrenal gland tumors are generally easier to get out than right adrenal gland tumors, and there's no evidence of invasion into the vena cava. So I would expect that this is going to be fairly straightforward, um, but we will just um, keep our fingers crossed, except not during the surgery. So I'm just going to do a midline abdominal exploratory here. Um, as always, please, if this is the first time you're watching, just subscribe to our channel and send um, a link to anybody else that you think might be interested in watching. We have the chat going as always, so please feel free to post any questions that you might have. And if somebody could just confirm that the audio is coming through, um, that would be really helpful. Um, so there's a question as to whether there's any breed disposition um, for adrenal gland tumors. And we see it, it tends to be in smaller breed dogs. Um, and I would imagine that probably poodles are predisposed. Um, but we see a lot of poodles, Las Opsos, um, uh, and even mixed breed dogs. So Alex, are you aware of any other breed predisposition for adrenal gland tumors? We have our resident smart person scrubbed in again today. Alex has just studied for her surgery board, so she's up to date on all the recent literature. So I have to be careful stuff that I say because she can actually pull me up if I'm making it up. So uh, we always make a complete uh, exploratory incision going from the xiphoid all the way down to beyond the umbilicus. And if we're interested in the caudal half of the body, then we're going to go all the way down to the pubis. We also always remove the falciform ligament um, because it makes visualization so much easier. If you're doing abdominal exploratories, you really need to remove the falciform or at least remove it from one side and make sure you do a nice long incision. And then I would struggle to do abdominal exploratories without having suction and electrocautery. Um, in fact, I would be really reluctant to do abdominal exploratory surgery without um, at least electrocautery, and then also suction is really helpful. I'm up to the xiphoid here. As long as you stay ventral to the xiphoid, you cannot penetrate the diaphragm inadvertently. If you go off to the side, that's when you can inadvertently get into the diaphragm. So a nice view of the spleen right in the way here. Just extend my incision a little bit farther back. The liver actually does not look typical of a Cushingoid dog. Normally it's very rounded edges and a little bit more tan. This looks like a fairly normal appearing liver. Got the spoon if I could. Thank you. Great, thanks. So we'll do a complete exploratory, just looking at the diaphragm. So hepatic veins coming in. You guys probably can't see that into the vena cava, liver. It's fairly normal in appearance. Uh, gallbladder, so gallbladder is here, and we're going to express the gallbladder, make sure that the common bile duct is patent, which it is. 
Now I'm just going to palpate the stomach, make sure that there aren't any masses. Palpating the fundus of the stomach, coming out into the antrum and the pylorus. Then into the duodenum, and by retracting on the duodenum and using it to pull all the viscera out of the way, go ahead and retract on that, Nick. So we can see the pancreas really nicely right there. And then coming down into the fossa on the right-hand side, we see the vena cava. And then the right adrenal gland is really tiny. I can palpate it in there just underneath the vena cava. And then the right kidney is sitting right there. And as I come around the caudal duodenal flexure, we can see the duodenal colic ligament sitting right there. Tell him that I will see, oh, is that Anthony? I am going to be up there September 4th doing a lecture. So if you want to pop your head in and say hi, that would be great. Um, so I'm just working my way through the intestine, making sure there are no masses. Everything looks pretty normal here. You want to make sure that you don't twist the intestine around on the mesentery and create a mesenteric torsion. Now looking at the anti-mesenteric vessel right there, which makes that the ili uh, ileum, and then the cecum here, and then we get into the colon. And we'll pull the spleen out of the way here. Charles, if you're asking, um, how is the cat from yesterday with the tumor in the spine? So question about the cat from yesterday with the tumor in the spine. It's actually doing really well. We went back in today because I felt like my screws weren't quite long enough um, to provide adequate support. And so, um, but it's, uh, we've already come out and the dogs, uh, or the cat's fully ambulatory. Um, so let's see if we can see there. I might not be able to see very well. We'll go ahead and move your hand there. Probably don't need a hand there. I'm going to come around to that side, please. Nick, can you switch sides with me? All right, so can we see the adrenal gland tumor sitting right there? We can. Might move the camera a little bit farther back. Okay. Can I get a new glove, please? All right, so I'm just changing my gloves out here so we can see the adrenal gland tumor and left adrenal gland tumors compared to the right ones. Left ones are just such a treat because they're so far away from the vena cave and they're really easy to get out. That's how cautery set on third, 30. So I've got this extended um, electric cautery probe. I'm just going to use that to incise through the retroperitoneum. I'm just going to make my way all the way around the adrenal gland. You have to be a bit careful because the left renal vein often abuts right up against the tumor. Let's switch this over to my smaller one again. All right, can I get my loops, please? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Are there any post-op complications? Um, so generally, the, regarding post-op complications with a routine adrenalectomy that doesn't go into the vena cava, usually these guys recover really well. Um, you can occasionally see pulmonary thromboembolism. Um, you can... Uh, see hemorrhage, you can see uh, Addisonian crisis, but we prophylactically treat these guys with phlegocortisone as well as prednisolone, 
And so I have not seen an Addisonian crisis, to my knowledge, in any patient. There was a study, you know, some people will heparinize these patients um, beforehand, um, and I, I don't uh, do that. And there was a study that came out by a group in Ohio that showed they had some of the best survivals of any study ever done with adrenal gland tumors, and they also did not pretreat theirs with anything. So now this is the phrenical abdominal vein. If you look right here, that is always overlying the adrenal gland. And so if ever you can't find the adrenal gland, look for that phrenical abdominal vein, and it will be sitting right on top of it. So I'm just going to use my ligature here. And I'm going to ligature that phrenical abdominal vein. And failure to address that phrenical abdominal vein prior to removing the tumor is a real pain because they will start oozing and bleeding during the procedure. And so that's the first thing that I always do is to try to ligate that phrenical abdominal vein. I want to make sure that I'm staying far enough away from my renal vein back here, which I think is all the way back there. So that's the renal vein sitting right there. So it is actually very close. I'm just going to use a right angle forcep to separate the renal vein from the mass. Can you just hold on to that, please? Open a little bit. And I have inadvertently damaged the renal vein before um, while doing this requiring a nephrectomy. I'm just gonna keep working my way around the tumor with the ligature. I'm retracting the left kidney caudally. And uh, ligature just makes this procedure so much easier. So that's the aorta sitting right there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we're right up abutting the aorta. And you can remove these laparoscopically. A tumor like this size, with this little invasion, um, you can certainly remove these laparoscopically. I have not done that yet. It's certainly something that I'm interested in starting to do. So that's out, and we've given our solumedrol. Is that correct? All good? All right, so tumor's out. We've got no bleeding from the bed here. Aorta's sitting right there. Renal vein's intact. You want to check your kidney to make sure it doesn't look really congested or anything. Um, and that's pretty much it. So we will just pack our abdominal contents back into the abdomen. Can we get some warm saline, please?
So just lavage, and that's pretty much it. Um, question, exotics person, assuming the procedure would be similar in a ferret. Yeah, so um, look, the, the, the difference in ferrets, though, is that often there is been a cave invasion, and you can't isolate it. And so in ferrets, apparently, I think, that you can just take out the vena cava along with the adrenal gland tumor. I've only done that a couple of times, I think. Um, but that's, I think, kind of standard operating procedure um, with ferrets. Can I please have some, oh, uh, how, how much does this dog weigh? 12, just some OPDS, please. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm going to use O nylon. The reason why I'm using O nylon is because if the dog is cushing hard, it's going to have delayed wound healing. And we have seen abdominal dehiscence in one or two cases that we used absorbable suture because the wound healing was delayed. And, um, and so the suture broke down before the wound had a chance to heal. Uh, question, if you damage the renal vein, is there no way to salvage it? And the answer to that is, look, the vein, the renal vein is so fragile. I suppose if you are very experienced in vascular uh, techniques, you might be able to repair the renal vein. But I have found that every time I've tried to suture it, it just tears. Um, and so in my opinion, in my, or in my hands anyway, if I damage the renal vein, I pretty much have to sacrifice the kidney. And so postoperatively, we will monitor potassium a couple of times during the night. But if you're, if you're covering them with um, methylpredsodium succinate and fluoronef, uh, you, the risk of an Addisonian crisis is extremely low. What do you have going next, Alex? All right. Your liver lobectomy? Yeah. Oh, good job. Have to get Alex streaming her videos. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. Have you heard the question? Is it possible for a dog to have failed? Yeah, so the question is, is it possible for dogs to have both a phaochromocytoma and an adrenal cortical tumor? And the answer to that is yes. Um, we have seen it a few times. And so that's when the clinical signs can get quite confusing because you'll have both um, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, elevation of liver enzymes, and then you'll also have um, periods of hyperexcitability interspersed with periods of lethargy. And pheochromocytomas are generally more challenging in surgery for two reasons. One, they tend to be more invasive. They're more likely to be in the vena cava. And two, um, they uh, also are anesthetically much more unstable. So you're going to have you know, severe hypertension in the 300s, and then they'll drop down to hypotension um, you know, all within five minutes of each other. So they can be really tricky. As soon as you start manipulating the tumor during the surgery, um, you get into a pretty wild ride anesthetically. So 
No worries. I'll switch sides with you, Nick, when I'm finished with this. I have my son, Nick, here, who's a fourth year medical student, and he also wants to be a surgeon. He'll be the next generation of YouTube streamers. I don't know if they're as liberal with YouTube streaming in the human hospitals. What's that say? The, My own dog with a. He said, thank you because he's talking about his own dog. Right, okay. Yeah, so that the person that asked about the fair chromocytoma simultaneous with the adrenal cortical tumor is, uh, is the watcher's own dog. So hopefully that'll be resolved successfully. I have a flank fold soft tissue sarcoma today as well that I may try to live stream depending on where the nurses put me um, as far as which surgery suite is con uh, concerned. That should be a very straightforward and, and because it's occurring in the flank fold, we should have plenty of skin to close the defect. Shouldn't have to do any flap because basically the tumor is in the in the flank fold flap that we normally would take to reconstruct another area. So there should be plenty of skin there. What's that, Nick? Why is it mirrored? Why is it mirrored? Oh, I don't know. Uh, Janine, can you push that, see where it says PIP? 
the green lit button on there. Yep, yeah. just push that. Get rid of the blackened out CT scan. Uh, Janine, you can tell them that I'm finished with this surgery um, and that if they want to knock down my next one, they can. There's no rush, though. Thank you. Yep, so we are going to go on oral prednisolone as soon as it's um, awake enough to eat. Um, we need to start on fledgocortisone as well. And we will monitor uh, potassium every, say, four hours during the night. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, NSAIDs are fine. So just meloxicam, please. Uh, no ABs. Uh, sedation is fine. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So I have a question for everybody who's watching. Why is 2 PDS on a cutting needle? Why is the suture clear? So why is 2 PDS on a cutting needle clear when you buy it? I'll give you a couple of minutes to mull over that. No. Yeah, Nick, on the video, I don't know why it's mirrored, because it comes out correct when you watch the video later on. Might be because of like people are doing it as a like a selfie thing, and so they want it to be. Yeah. That's the only thing I can think of. Just commenting on the fact that when we look on our computer screen right now, the video is reversed left to right, um, and my son was just asking why that is, and we we're wondering if it's something to do with people like doing a, a video blog or something like that by themselves, where. Um, the, they want the video reversed so that when they're looking at their own computer screen, the orientation will be correct. I'm not sure. 
Any guesses on the PDS question? So the reason that it's clear is that that's the most common suture used for intradermal suture patterns. And in light skin people, the purple of normal PDS would show through the skin. And so that's why it's clear. Same for monocryl. Same for monocryl. Nick says. All right, so we're going to go ahead and discontinue the video since I'm finished here. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can post them in the comments. And again, please subscribe to our channel and send a link to anybody that you think might be interested. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to live stream this soft tissue sarcoma later on today. If I can, you will be the first to know. Um, So thanks a lot for watching, and we will talk to you soon.